Hello everyone! Hi! Welcome to the stream. Welcome to the stream. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the stream. Bam 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 Okay. Hi! And um uh, I, I believe I actually started the stream. So hey, it's an improvement over last time where I talked to myself for exactly 35 minutes until I decided to check and see if things were running and they were not. Hi. We're growing. We're maturing. We're, we're developing together. That's what's happening. Hey, Leo season. Get out of here with that. <laughs> Oh my god, do we need to talk about Leo's more? I guess. Okay. Fine. Fine. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I am feeling my full Lunasad, Lunasa, Lamas, fiery, burnt orange realness right now. <laughs> <laughs> Only the gods know about those 35 minutes. That's it. So I, that was the sacrifice. It had to be that way. Nothing to be done for it. Um, cool. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Make yourselves at home. I'm assuming you probably are at home while you're watching this, so welcome. Um, if you have not already... <clears throat> you might go grab a snack, grab something to drink, grab something to smoke if you enjoy that. Um, get yourself comfy and cozy. Grab a journal and uh, something to write with. Um, you might light a candle. You might light a little incense. Um, set the mood for yourself. Um, and if you uh, are curious about the workbook that we're going to be using tonight in class, you can head to my website www.meganangus.com, M-E-A-G-A-N-A-N-G-U-S.com, uh, and head to the Wheel of the Year section, and you can uh, download just the workbook for this class for $7, or uh, for a $30 donation, you'll get access to the Dropbox folder for the six-week guide, which is uh, this workbook, all the slides that we're going to use in class tonight, and a recording of this class. Um, and or join my Patreon and you um, will have access to the Dropbox, fo Dropbox folder at the $9 level and up. That's the Venus level um, and higher. Um, and those are all of the different ways to get this stuff if you would like to study along with us as we go along. Um, we will wait a few more minutes, see who else joins us, and we will get started here in just a second. Uh, in the meantime, as I said, grab yourself a beverage, uh, grab something to eat, get yourself cozy, open a window, close a window, turn on the 17th fan, you know, whatever you have to do to get yourself right. Um, and uh, as we wait just a couple more minutes for everybody to show up, um, uh, let me talk about this series just a little bit. This is the wheel of the series. I have been teaching this class since uh, 2015 publicly. Um, <clears throat> my life with the wheel has been long. I've been working the wheel for a couple of decades now, just as an individual person. And in the mid to late 2000s, I started hosting uh, private parties at home for my friends, my family, and community members um, to create a space that was fun and playful, where you could be curious about spiritual practice and curious about pagan tradition. Um, and there wasn't really any way to offend anybody. There wasn't a wrong thing to say or do. Um, but mostly just to create an environment for people to come and explore and experiment with these concepts. I worked with a lot of folks who were recovering Christians or atheists that are not interested in worshiping deities, but are interested in working with archetypes, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that all started then. And um, by 2015, it had definitely become something that I felt 
the universe was um, calling me to come and do the work. So I began to teach these classes publicly in 2015 with the Lunasod class. Uh, so this is in fact my sixth year um, of going around and uh, spinning the wheel and being spun <laughs> by the wheel, to be sure. Uh, <laughs> so welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, if you are um, curious about the workbook that we're using tonight, this can be downloaded from my website from the Wheel of the Year section. All the links are there. Okay. Um, all right, we have dallied enough. Let's get into it. Okay, let's go, people. That's not the line from the movie, but we're going to be politically correct. Let's go, people. Uh, this is Lunasod, and it is hot, and I hate it. Okay, that's the whole class. Thanks for coming. No. <laughs> JK. Uh, no, but I really do hate it. <laughs> so I might be the worst person to teach a Lunasod class because I am not a fan of the summer. I am not a fan of the heat. I actually just wrote, uh, put up a big piece about this, about my love-hate relationship with the sun and summer. And so one of the ways that I um, have pushed through that is by learning uh, modern and traditional symbolism and practice tied to this holiday and trying to figure out what's the big deal, why is this such an important holiday. Um, I feel like Lunasad ends up being one of the flyover holidays. <laughs> We've got uh, Beltane, which everybody's really excited about. Summer Solstice will get some attention. And then everybody's just sort of checked out until Halloween or Samhain. They're like, I don't know. I'm probably doing something that weekend, whatever. Um, so we're going to give it some attention this year. So here we go. <laughs> that, YouTube edited that comment. I'll, side note, YouTube, thank you. I've got this. What the hell? <laughs> Please, step off. Um, all right. Lunasod. Um, first and foremost, let's talk about the name Lunasod. It is pronounced a couple different ways. Um, Lunasod is what I learned. Uh, emphasis on the Lu or Lug at the beginning. Uh, Lunasa is another way that this word is pronounced. And of course, another very common name for this holiday is Lamas. Um, and so let's start, um, <laughs> let's start at the start. Okay, major themes for witches. These are themes that a lot of modern pagan traditions are focused on during this time of year. Power, maturation, leadership and production um power performance strength leadership competition production all of this stuff these are the key words for the work that we are doing at this time of year lunasod and uh hey i'm gesturing to the right direction <laughs> And this is potent stuff, right? These are these are words that carry a lot of baggage with them in some in some places. Power for one, right? Competition. There's a lot of there's a lot of like Ugh, that that could go wrong there. So let's talk about the fact first off that this holiday has two names, and they are both really popular names: Lunasad or Lunasa and Lamas. Okay. Lamas means loaf means a loaf of bread. And that imagery is coming to us through the incredible amount of grain imagery that is uh, coming to fruition at this time of year, literally and figuratively. This is the first harvest. And we'll talk about the different names of the holiday, all the different names a little bit later in class, but um, Lamas means loaf or loaf of bread or bread loaf, and it ties directly into this, um, this grain cycle situation that's happening here in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, the closer you are to the equator here on the planet, um, the more likely it is that the people around you are, in fact, experiencing their first harvest of the year, and it is a grain harvest. 
uh, rye, corn, wheat, all of that stuff is, is coming to head right now. Um, and so the, the name Lamas, bread loaf, speaks directly to that. But it also speaks very directly to these themes of production, um, these themes of even performance, we might say, in that. Are you producing? What are you producing? Um, remember, we're, we're working the wheel. It's a cycle. So we've left the energy of spring, which was putting seeds in the ground, experimenting, expanding, questioning, being curious about things. And we've moved into summer, which is requiring some commitment from us. And the reason that we are being required of by the universe um, of our commitment is this idea that things are starting to produce, things are starting to come to fruition, and we need to be there to sort of catch the baby, as it were. So we have that theme um, really featured uh, strongly in the idea of uh, the word llamas. And then the other very common name for this holiday is Lunasa or Lunasad. And when we are saying that name, and, we'll, and you can see it right here in the title, those first four letters, L-U-G-H, spell the name of a god, Lug, who was a Celtic, that's a, that's a loaded term, but a, a Celtic deity is a Celtic deity who is a storm god, a fire god, a, a competitive god, a solar deity. Um, he's hot, he's sexy, he's young, he's brash, he can't be stopped. Um, and so this holiday is also in celebration of uh, him or it, that archetype, and um, some of the festivals that uh, he brought into the world. And so when we really think about that as a name for this holiday, we move away a little bit from the idea of just production, right? Of just the beginning of like the fertility cycle of, of the harvest season. And we move more into an idea around power, leadership, competition, and ultimately maturation. Ultimately stepping into um, a more mature version of ourself, a more committed version of ourself. Okay. So let's talk about all of this stuff because it's, there's a lot. It's a big holiday. Um, this is a, an interesting thing about working the wheel. Uh, side note, if it's your first time here, hi, I go on tangents. So, <laughs> so definitely get something to eat, settle in. Um, but it, it's, um, okay, yeah, I will go on that tangent a little bit later. All right. So the big symbols that we are working with for this holiday are fire, the sun, production, uh, competition, personal power, fruits of labor, performance, strength, leadership, wisdom, sacrifice, and taking the best. Okay, that is a lot. I will go off on this tangent. Um, when I first began to work the wheel, I saw I was familiar with some holidays and not familiar with others. But I thought, thank you, good, I'm glad you love my tangents. <laughs> um, but I really thought that once I learned about all eight holidays, they would all weigh the same. They would all take up the same amount of psychic space. They would all give and take the same amount of energy. And my... Um, my personal exploration of that is that that's not the case. In fact, we have quarter holidays and cross quarter holidays in the Sabbath cycles. And the quarter holidays are the solstice and the equini. They are the uh, spring equinox, fall equinox, the winter solstice, the summer solstice. And in my experience, they kind of are tied to an individual sign. And they may take up four, five, maybe six weeks worth of the calendar. And then they're sort of couched in between the cross-quarter holidays, which are Imbolc, Beltane, Lunasad, and Samhain. And in my experience, um, both energetically and just literal time-wise, those holidays tend to take up a closer to two months worth of time and kind of spread out over the, over the, the uh, span of two signs or two, two uh, signs in the zodiac. So for me, 
Lunasad season really starts when the sun goes into Leo, which is July 20th to 23rd. Um, technically speaking, modern pagans and modern witches celebrate Lunasad on August 1st into August 2nd. Um, and ancient uh, folk would have actually celebrated the season of Lunasad over the course of several weeks. So when I rattle off a big long list of all of the things that we might be working on in this holiday, that's where I'm coming from. We're not expected to do it all on the same day. This is in theory a season that we are gonna settle into and work on for a while. And as that happens, seasons change. Okay, that was terrible, sorry. But, um, but as that happens, the seasons do change. It's still summer, but it's a different type of summer, right? The, the beginning of August, August 1st, feels significantly different than September 20th feels, right? By the time we've reached fall equinox, especially the closer you are to a pole, um, the more severe and the more extreme that weather shift is and that seasonal shift is. So it makes sense to me that we might have a lot of different work, a lot of work and a lot of different types of work to do in the cross quarter holidays and Lunasad or Lamas is no exception. So um, we've got, as I was saying, the fire, sun, production, competition, personal power, fruits of labor, performance, strength, leadership, wisdom, sacrifice, and taking the best. Okay. And these piles of duties, this witch's work that we have in front of us, divides actually very nicely between the two signs, if I'm, if I'm thinking of it, really. And the two signs that we're dealing with are Leo, of course, and then Virgo. Virgo takes care of the last four weeks of Lunasad season and the last four weeks of summer are all encapsulated in Virgo. And then we shift, we have fall equinox and that brings in Libra season and we move on from there. You gotta come to the next class for that stuff. Okay, so coming back to that idea that we have two different very common names for this holiday, this actually sits very comfortably with me. And so in some years, I find myself really attracted or drawn to the imagery of llamas the bread loaf, the production, witnessing the, the surge of fecundity in the natural world and really seeing things produce and become abundant and, you know, really burst out of themselves. And it's like, oh my gosh, here comes the bounty. This is incredible. Sometimes my relationship to that symbolism is that I'm feeling like the grain that's coming out of the earth. Sometimes my relationship to that symbolism is that I feel like the farmer that's tilling the earth and, and drawing that, that fecundity up and out, drawing that natural power up and out of the, of the ground and witnessing that miracle of the grains growing. But other years, I really align or feel really close to the Lunasad uh, symbolism, the, the Lunasa symbolism, and the ideas of power, competition, leadership, and maturation really come to the fore for me. So, um, and, 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 the, and the things that we are required to do with that stuff, um, the, uh, the things that we're being asked by the gods or the universe or our situation um, to do with those things. So, um, so we have options, kids. <laughs> we got a big long season and I totally recommend kind of feeling your way through all of these different energetic pieces and seeing, you know, what, what's right for you this week, what's right for you today, what's right for you at this portion of the season, what's right for you at that portion. Um, okay, so let's talk about these themes a little bit. What are we doing here? We're, we're talking about power, maturation, leadership, production, competition, strength, but performance, but what does that mean? Okay, uh, so this holiday is, uh, as the name Lunasad, is named for the Irish god Lug who was or is a very bright, brash, young um, storm god, warrior god, and solar god. Uh, he is connected to, or it is connected to, competition, power, um, being a warrior, fighting for what you uh, believe in, 
um, fighting on behalf of something larger than yourself. And um, throughout the month of August, uh, we would have seen in the ancient world the uh, the Lunasod games or the Taltu games, uh, which were at least a couple of weeks, if not the entire month of August. And these games are totally in conjunction with something like the Olympic Games. It's very possible, in fact, that the Irish Celts learned about the Olympic Games and were like, heck yeah, let's do that. That makes perfect sense for this time of year. My gut, my intuition, so take that with a grain of salt, um, my intuition says that the Celts probably already had some sort of festive summertime competition merchant get together something something already going on and then when the romans came up and brought their traditions with them um they were like hey we already kind of let's just call it that and do it like that these games and this festival season were dedicated to tell to sorry if i'm mispronouncing that please don't strike me with lightning um who was or is lou's foster mother not his biological mom, but his real mom all the same. And this is a classic uh, Celtic goddess in that she does it all. She is a fertility goddess. She's a warrior. She's a provider. She is a skill carrier and teacher, very similar in spirit to a goddess like Brigid, um, who, incidentally, we worship at uh, Imbolc, which is the opposing holiday at this time of year. Imbolc comes right after winter solstice, Lunasad comes right after summer solstice, and they sit across from each other on the wheel. Um, so again, kind of interesting that we have another version of this very fiery, hot, skilled um, uh, goddess who's able to make tools and teach people things and all of this stuff. Um, a single mom, right? Basically a single mom. That's what we're talking about. And um, she had just passed away. And so Lug is actually holding uh, these festivals, this massive festival in these co competitions in honor of her passing as a celebration of her life and a celebration of all of the things that she provided to her people. Um, and keep that symbolism, make a note there, put a little asterisk next to that because we see this death in life aspect a lot in Lunasad season. We are gonna talk about death in the heart of all of this life and power a lot in this season. Uh, all right, any questions? Good, okay, sorry. <laughs> We're on 20 second delay, that's the joke. Okay, um, let me pause, read the comments. Just, oh, my hair looks so good, thank you. I, I literally just hacked at it with a straight razor about a half hour ago, so awesome, thank you. Um, Happy, sunny, lion, sexy, wheat, death times. I know it's time to kill and screw and eat stuff. Maybe in that order, maybe not, whatever. We'll figure it out. Okay. Um, okay, so in this Lunasod version of Lunasod or the Lug or Lu version of Lunasod, we have a big heavy emphasis on things like fire and the sun and competition and personal power, performance and strength and leadership. There's a big, big push for that. Um, but another very common uh, title or name for this holiday is, as I was saying, Lamas or the first harvest. Um, let me just go to... Oh, is it going to work? Yeah, come on, technology. You will be my bitch. Okay, um, moving on. First harvest is, did I even put that on there? Oh, hilarious. I didn't even put it on there. So there you go. First harvest, write it down. It's a, a secret stash. Um, and it is reflecting just that, obviously. It's the first harvest of the year. Again, uh, we are seeing the grain crops, crops like wheat, and corn and rye and barley are all coming to ripeness at this time of year. It's already totally started. In fact, we can, we can even uh, see it starting as early as the middle, beginning middle-ish of July, um, really close to the equator, places like Turkey, 
um, obviously not super close to the equator, but relatively close, uh, closer than Finland, for example, um, are, they are already celebrating first harvest. They are already celebrating the, the reaping of the grain crops. Uh, we are seeing that in the very most southern places here in the United States. And over the course of this season, if you get a chance, drive out to some farmland and watch and you will see the grain harvests are coming in at this time of year and it will literally move up like a green and gold band across the continent getting you know and then eventually move up into canada and continue north as the season progresses um a, a tradition at this time of year would have been for um the village, the farmers, whether you were working your individual farm or you were working with other farmers in the area and taking care of the collective food source, the very first collection of grain harvested, whether that was the first handful or the first sickle swing, uh, the very first collection of harvest of grain out of the harvest would have been immediately taken from the field and brought back to the main house and pounded down by hand into flour and then baked into a loaf of bread. And that bread, then a couple of different things happened with it depending on the region and the era. Um, but sometimes that bread was split up amongst everybody that was working the harvest and everybody would take a, a small bite of it. Um, other times the bread is broken up and everybody takes a little piece of it home and tucks a piece of it into their, um, their fields that they are about to begin to harvest or it's tucked into the corners of a barn or tucked into the corners of a house, um, thereby bringing the, the uh, power and the virility that is jutting up out of the ground in these golden grains directly into the house, directly into the community. Um, and so you would either eat it or you would use it as a protection and a blessing um, in your environment. So it was sort of that acknowledgement of the power that's coming right up out of the soil and saying, whoop, we're taking that and we're, we're distributing that immediately. Um, and something that we will talk about a little bit more in the Maybon class and a lot more in the Samhain class, Maybon being second harvest and Samhain being the third and the last harvest, is an entity called the Puka Fairy. Uh, the Puka Fairy is, again, a, a Celtic tradition. And um, the Puka Fairy uh, were thought to be... Um, I hesitate to use the word malevolent, but certainly amoral. <laughs> That's probably the best way to put it, because fairy definitely think about morals and morality in an extremely different way than humans do. Um, if something was to be harvested and it was not harvested by Samhain, it was kind of like, oh well, we're not gonna pull that in because the puka fairy has taken it at that point. And in my opinion, this is a, um, a simple way of explaining mold and mildew and fungus that would have started to grow on grains, berries, vegetables, fruits that were being harvested um, and, you know, ultimately leading to sickness, death, or in the best results, a wild ass hallucinogenic trip. And you know, if you're down for that, cool, enjoy your next 12 hours, but if you're not, uh, that's, you know, hello, Salem witch trials. So, ugh, you know, right? Uh, not so much of a worry right now, but by the end of October, if you have not brought it into the fields, it has, it has it's food for the Shadowlands now. It's no longer of this realm. Um, so. The reason that I mention that, though, now in this class is because, again, even in the heart of all of this heat and light and power that we're feeling and experiencing from our sun that is providing all of this wonderful, intense heat. <laughs> no, we love it. It's great. <clears throat> there's death. There's still change. There's still the creeping in of the shadow, the creeping in of the darkness. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. Moving on. Some other names for this holiday are names like Midsummer. Wait, there we go. Midsummer. <laughs> loaf Mass, which is just the druid ridiculous spelling of loaf. Druids. 
uh, Frey Fest. Um, Frey is a, another name for Lug and other solar deities from this time of year. Um, some other names that we get from this time of year are La Lonaise uh, and Lamas Tide. And a lot of these are simply ways, different mis different spellings, misspellings, different spellings or just different ways of saying the idea of loaf mass, loaf mass, loaf mass over and over again, or simply the month of August. That's also a lot of what these names mean is simply this time of year, this stretch of time. Okay. Moving on to, let's talk about these little symbols a little more. The sun, grain, bread loaf, a head, and burning a burning wheel. These are all really traditional symbols that we see <clears throat> here at Lunasod season. The sun, obviously it's summertime here in the uh, Northern Hemisphere, and <clears throat> the sun is king. The sun is raining overhead. The sun is driving some people crazy. The sun is sending other people into paroxysms of bliss, right? Yay for the sun. Um, it is the ruling planet, quote unquote, or celestial body of the sign of Leo, which is the astrological sign that is uh, happening right now in the sky. Um, and uh, yeah, solar energy, solar power, solar heat, solar thrust. Um, that is very much exactly why we are working with the symbol of the sun at this time. Grain and a bread loaf, obviously we're getting a lot of that because it is the first harvest, it is the grain harvest, all of that good stuff. A burning wheel, we'll come to the head in just a second, a burning wheel. Uh, it was a tradition um, in some Celtic areas, especially in Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, um, to either at Letha or here at Lunasod, get an eight-spoked wheel, cover it in tar or pitch, light it on fire, and roll it down a hill. And in places like Glastonbury Tor and other uh, really infamous pagan sites, um, uh, you, depending on where you're standing, the hill uh, is sloped in such a manner that as you watch sunset on these days, the sun actually appears to be rolling down the edge of the hill. And so this burning wheel would have been something similar to that idea of starting at the top of the hill and we're rolling down and it's on fire and it's out of control and it's, it's burning, man. It's just, it's burning, man. It's burning, man. Okay. Um... But that idea of the burning wheel rolling down a hill is also really important. Not just because it's fire and fire's cool, right? We love that. But also because there is an acknowledgement by ancient pagans that at this time of year, we are at the pinnacle of the sun's power. And the sun's power is only waning from here on out. From now until winter solstice, the sun's energy gets weaker and weaker and weaker. The sun rises lower and lower in the sky. It's more and more southerly on the eastern and western horizon when it rises and sets. And uh, because of that experience, um, our days get, well, not just because of that, but also because of the tilt of the planet, our days become shorter, our nights become longer, things get colder, and ultimately stuff stops growing. The whole fertility cycle here on the planet Earth halts for a couple of months or several months, depending on where you are on the planet. So that burning wheel is also sort of an acknowledgement of that idea of like, we are starting out at the top of the roller coaster and we, it's all downhill from here. Uh, we are only gonna, we're only gonna ebb or wane from this point forward. Okay. I want to talk about that a little bit more, actually. Uh, checking the chat. Oh, I'm so hot. Thank you. I have 18 fans blowing on me from every direction. I am quite hot, actually. Uh, Pooka Fair Story. One of my favorite examples of witchy stuff serving a perfectly effective warning before there was science to explain it. Exactly. I mean, if you want to eat those berries, that's fine. But you are not coming back into the house for two days. So, because, no. <laughs> not in the mood to deal with that. Again, Burning Man. Okay, we're all on the same page here. All right. Um, 
If you have the workbook, look at it. But otherwise, here, let me do this. There we go. Okay. If you have the workbook, look at it. Otherwise, uh, this figure right here is the clumsy graphic that I designed several years ago based on a graphic out of the Witch's Bible Complete by Janet and Stuart Farrar. If you are curious about the structure of modern Wicca and modern paganism, go check out that book. It is everything. Um, and in particular, what I love about that book is they have a wonderful chunk of history and tradition uh, to explain why they suggest what they suggest for each of the Sabbaths. And because they give you so much history, you can read that stuff and decide if that applies to you or not, or if there's something else that you would like to include, or maybe something that you would like to take out because you don't work with a deity or you don't work with a set of symbols or what have you. Uh, it is a wonderful book. It's really well written. Um, can't recommend it highly enough. Okay, so in this graphic, which is significantly less cool than the one that's in their book because if there are any graphic designers out there that want to, you know, <clears throat> call me. Okay. What we're looking at here is this bar is the goddess and this curve that starts out small, goes up high and starts out and then goes back down again. This is the sun god. And we think of sometimes in some traditions, the god is thought of as the steady consistent thing and the goddess is thought of as the waxing and waning thing because of her connection to the moon well the sun and the moon exchange genders in many different pagan traditions the sun and moon have no gender the sun and moon are all genders um, it's very common to find female suns and male moons so that idea doesn't necessarily work everywhere but this idea this concept um, is that the goddess is this one consistent thing. She may change form, but her energy is always there, and it's always consistent, versus the sun, whose energy is small and then gets big and then gets small again. And that reflects, for us in the northern hemisphere, the waxing and waning between winter solstice up to summer solstice and from summer solstice back down to winter solstice. Obviously in the southern hemisphere it's literally the exact opposite but it's the same idea. The goddess is consistent but the god waxes and wanes. Summer solstice is their wimpy time <laughs> and winter solstice is the big hot spot for them um, but literally the same idea. And so in this um, we see these little bumps right here you know I could just put this I could make one of these graphics and put it up to share but uh, why um, we see these three little legs right here those bumps represent in order Beltane Letha and Lunasad so Beltane back in the end of April beginning of May Letha that's summer solstice June 20th approximately and then Lunasad here at August 1st. And they represent three moments of sacrificial mating between deities, between the goddess and the god energies. Uh, the reason why they are happening at this time of year is because summer solstice is the height of the solar power. Again, that waxing and waning idea. Summer solstice is the height of that power. So at Beltane, the goddess comes in and wants to scoop up energy from the de from the god at nearly their highest or their maximum potential then they scoop up more energy at letha or summer solstice at the highest maximum potential and then here comes one more scoop of energy at lunasad which is again the highest maximum potential before it ebbs down and down and down from this point um and that ebbing thing, that scooping, that sacrificing, that taking the best is really important. That is a symbol that echoes through the work that we're doing at this holiday continuously. Okay. The goddess arc. All pertinent deity aspects are living in the height of their power at this time. 
sitting in their seat of authority, grasping their will, and beginning to produce results here on the physical plane. This process will ultimately deplete them, but for now, they rage. And if you were here for my Beltane class, I highly recommend going back and reading the paragraph um, about the goddess arc, or this paragraph, this first paragraph in particular, um, and how it's phrased for Beltane. And just consider the, um, the similarities and, and, and consider the differences between how we are phrasing things and how we are approaching the energy at Beltane versus how we are approaching the, the energy here at Lunaside. Um, the Holly King, known as the Dark Twin, kicks off his reign of the waning half of the year with sex and death at the hands of the goddess. Party. The deity is the living embodiment of power. The deity pushes that force into the harvest and then is sacrificed as the plants are harvested. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about this mating and sacrifice thing. Um, we know, let's, let's talk about sacrifice for a little bit. Okay. Because it's a touchy subject. People are generally, they don't, they're not into it anymore. Nobody wants to be sacrificed. Whatever. Ugh, God. So, you know, everybody's got to have their thing, right? I need to sacrifice. Me, 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 me. Whatever. Okay. Uh, when we talk about sacrifice, we can, we're, we can approach that concept from a couple of different directions. First off, nobody has to die. Nobody has to die. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry. Nobody has to die. We can sacrifice habits. We can sacrifice behaviors. We can sacrifice, um, uh, luxuries, right? There's a lot of things that we can sacrifice. We can sacrifice our time. We can sacrifice money. We don't necessarily have to give of our flesh and blood. But when we roll back through time, we get a different, we, we have the capacity to conceptualize sacrifice in a different way because of the way that people treated re reincarnation and immortality. Um, in different eras, and even still today, because there are definitely uh, many large, large <laughs> uh, populaces around the planet that still practice reincarnation. They still believe in it. Um, and so it's possible. We don't know, right? Because we don't have written record for most of these people. But it is possible that this god king who has been chosen, right, um, goes and lays with the high priestess who is the embodiment of the goddess, the land, the fertility, and uh, pushes their, the king pushes their power into the high priestess, into the queen. Um, and they know this person's going to get pregnant. That's me in there. I'll be back in nine, ten months tops. Don't touch my stuff. I'll be back. I'm, I'm still going to want the $5 that you owe me. It will be me. Um, and so it is possible that some people in the ancient era who participated in sacrifices did so willingly to some degree, up to being totally willing and super excited about it. Um, I expect that there have been plenty of humans and plenty of animals that have been sacrificed ritually who would have been anywhere else on that day. They're like, no thanks. Don't want to be a part of your goofy blood party. Thank you. Um, and, and yet, that's where they were at. Um, so, so sacrifice in the ancient era, kind of grim, kind of brutal. Um, plenty of people sacrificed who were not volunteers, not excited about being a part of it. But very possible that some of the people who participated in sacrifice were willing, they did volunteer, and what they believed was my energy is going to go into the land. Because when it was a king or a god, god king type leader person, um, you know, <clears throat> a president, for example, perhaps, uh, what would happen is that the person was ritually killed in very specific ways. And then ultimately, oftentimes, their body was chopped up into a bunch of pieces and fed to the land. Fed literally to those crops that are growing, that are about to be sacrificed at this time of year. And if it wasn't 
pushed into the soil, if people's body parts were not buried out with the crops, they were put into a local bog or a local marsh or a local swamp, a lake, a stream, a body, not a stream, excuse me, a, a lake, a, a, a pond of some sort, a body of water nearby, especially if that body of water was responsible for irrigating those crops. So the idea is, you know, I'm the embodiment of this power and I'm going to sacrifice myself and push myself back into the soil and back into the system to feed the mother. <laughs> feed the mother. <laughs> but ultimately, we are eating of her body as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. Okay. So um, the Holly King is very different from the Oak King. Um, for Wiccans and Pagans that work with this and witches that, that work with the concept of the Holly King and the Oak King. Holly King, Oak King, two very different dudes. Very, very different. Um, the Oak King is very Saturnine. The Oak King is old, wise, experienced, um, has seen it, has done it, um, is able to teach others, and um, is trapped or help be held to, we might say, tradition. The Oak King says, this is the way it's always been done. And the Oak King doesn't really want to get involved with things like change. Um, the, <laughs> that's a much <laughs> yes. yes, Lark, I said it. Um, the Oak King doesn't want to get involved in change. The Oak King doesn't want to stir stuff up. The Oak King wants to keep things the way that they have always been, wants to adhere to tradition, adhere to... Um, the, the information that has been passed down from generation to generation. This has worked every time. Let's do it again. That's the Oak King. We are not in the reign of the Oak King right now. We are in the reign of the Holly King currently. The Holly King is brash, young, inexperienced, totally committed to wearing tight jeans. Uh, the Holly King is um, courageous, bold, will totally whip out their sword and wave it in somebody's face. Like, I don't give a fuck, mother, blah, blah, you know, it's that energy. Doesn't know any better. Um, and part of this is what gets the Holly King killed or maimed or wounded in some way and weakened. And we'll talk about that transition in from, from one form of the Holly King into the next. But we need that attitude, right? Because if we only adhere to the parts of ourselves that know better, we never grow. But if we listen to the parts of ourselves that are like, I don't care, this is what I want. I'm going for this. Nobody else has ever tried it, I'm gonna try it. Nobody, everybody else has tried it and failed, I'm gonna try it and succeed, let's go. Um, we need that part of us. What is important to remember about that part of us is that it is brave, it is bold, it's brash, it doesn't know any better, but it's also short-lived. Um, this is a burnout versus fade away kind of scenario and the holly king definitely burns out um hot fiery loud fast let's go let's go let's go very clever um but not long lived short on life great in the sack short on life that's the holly king um super sexy super sexy we love the holly king we we we, we stand we're following on tiktok it's wonderful um but not long for this world okay so before I go on to all of the rest of the stuff that I have to talk about in this class, I don't normally do this, but I want to be a little bit more pointed about the symbolism of this holiday and our current world, our current political situation. Um, there are a couple of ways to work with the metaphors of Lunasad that sit grimly but comfortably with what we are experiencing in our country right now. In one way, we have a Holly King leading the show. Brash, loud, doesn't know any better, doesn't care. In another way, we have the Holly King embodied in protesters all over our country. Young, inexperienced, passionate, but possibly burning out, um, loud and hot, um, and going really, really fast, and being very clever and being very quick, um, but ultimately not necessarily 
uh, possessing of longevity. And it's, it's tough. <laughs> I, I often find myself aligning or, or feeling closer to Oak King energy in my life. And when I look out into the streets, when I attend protests or I'm, or I'm, I'm educating myself about what's happening in the world, and I'm looking at who has stepped forward, who the leaders are um, of this movement, it's a bunch of kids. It's a bunch of kids who have, who are totally fed up. They're very passionate. Um, they have every right to be angry, but they don't necessarily have the connections of the networks of, of people. They don't have access to power and money the way that other people do in, in this situation. Um, they are out there in shorts and a tank top and sandals screaming at a cop in their face that is completely dressed for war, right? Very, very different. Not, not prepared for this. Doesn't know. And, and, and here's that thing where I, I, I want to use this phrase, doesn't know any better. But I do not mean that in a diminishing sense when I'm talking about these young people in the street. I'm, I'm saying that they don't know any better in the sense of the Oak King in us sees that cop out there suppressing First Amendment rights and is like, oh God, that's really scary. I don't know if I wanna go and deal with that. That's gonna hurt my knees, my, you know, oh, what, if, what if this, what if that? The young person is saying, I don't give a shit. I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna look at what my, war, my competitor or my foe might be carrying or might be armed with or might be trained with. I'm not even gonna look. I'm just gonna get out there and do the thing that I'm super, super passionate about. Interestingly enough, um, when our Holly Kings are sacrificed at this time of year, the most common uh, wounds or, or um, blows that are given to the victim uh, happen to the head and neck exclusively. They are beheaded, their throats are slit, uh, they are hanged, um, or there is simply a rope tied around their neck um, they are bashed in the head. Sometimes an eye or both eyes are taken out. It could be any combination of these things. One thing, usually there's three forms that happen, if you, especially if you see multiple forms, and you usually do see multiple forms of injury to whoever the victim is. And I cannot ignore how many people in these protests have been shot in the eye. How many people have been shot in the forehead? shot in the face. Yes, people have received injuries in other parts of their body, but so many protesters have been shot in the eye, in the forehead, or in the face. Um, again, you know, perhaps I am projecting this imagery onto our times, but I think that I am perceiving this imagery in our times. And um, when I began to see that earlier, it really startled me um, because it was so blatant to me. It was so obvious. Okay. Um, is there anything else I want to say about that? Of course, there always is more, but we're going to move forward. The other thing I would like to say about the Holly King and the sacrificial deaths that happen this time of year with whatever king god leader entity is being sacrificed by the village or the spiritual tradition, um, the closer we are to the equator the more mellow that is. It's much more common that you see something where um, somebody takes a symbolic injury and that's it. Like that, that was their injury, that was their sacrifice, the cut has been made, we all saw it, and now we can go on with the, the rest of the season and summer into fall. Um, they maybe go on an underworld journey. It's relatively, it's relatively mellow. The closer we get to the poles, however, the more severe and hardcore the death and, uh, and I don't wanna say punishment, but whatever the wounds are that the god or the king is taking at this time of year of the sacrifice, it's much more likely to actually be a death, not a symbolic sacrifice. It's much more likely to be something like a beheading versus just a like, oh, we nicked your cheek, that was on your face, you know, we got you. 
um, it, it's much more extreme. The closer we get to the poles, it's much more extreme. And to me, that very much reflects the relationship that humans have with the cycles of nature at the equator versus up at the North Pole, right? Summertime versus wintertime at the equator, meh. What's it, a 10 degree difference? Who cares? Okay, I'm wearing longer shorts in February and I wear no pants at all in August. You know, that that's about the, the difference. You're, you're still getting rain cycles and growth cycles and all of that stuff versus heading somewhere like Greenland. Um, it's freaking cold, right? Iceland, it's freaking cold. The, the top of Siberia, it's freaking cold. And it's cold and dark for months and months and months. And, um, and so you'll see that extreme sacrifice happening at the poles where there's this very definitive like no we have to cut this energy down and take all of it and shove it into the ground and pray that it's enough to get the crops through their entire growth cycle before the dark and the cold and the weather really come in um yeah okay bill this particular historical Moment begin with someone being asphyxiated too. Hello. Literally. Neck. Right? Literally neck. It's a lot, kids. It's pretty thick this year. It's pretty thick this year. Okay. Let's move on. Oops, I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> Don't look at that. We're not there yet. Okay. <laughs> All right. As we look around the planet, we see holidays all over the planet that focus on authority, leadership, work and labor, fruition and sacrifice. And some other things that I might put on this list would be um, allyship holidays and a few holidays that are centered on death, um, death gods in particular, they're actually pretty potent deities. So again, here's where we're gonna come into that um, uh, death in life symbolism. Okay, as we look around the globe and throughout time, we see cultures all over the Northern Hemisphere participating in rituals and festivals, celebrating this cross-quarter holiday through authority, leadership, work, and fruition in alignment with this cross-quarter fire festival. This is a fiery festival. Yet again, set everything on fire. It, 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 just accept and assume that if it's a pagan holiday, somebody's going to start a bonfire somewhere and you're supposed to dance around it or run through it. Just, just assume that that's part and parcel to anything that's going on. Okay. So on August 1st and 2nd, we have obviously the, the modern pagan, um, uh, modern witchcraft acknowledgement of Lunasad or Lamas, August 1st into August 2nd. But other holidays that were or are happening around uh, the planet on those same days, uh, the Feast of the Grain Harvest from Old Greece, the Feast of Osiris from Egypt, uh, the Day of Loki as, and Sigyn, uh from Odinist or Norse uh, practice, the Feast of St. Sophia from Catholicism, and the Feast of Kamal from the Baha'i tradition. And then um, throughout the Lunasad season, uh, other holidays that we are seeing are the Wedding of Isis and Osiris, the Feast of Mary Magdalene from uh, Catholicism, uh, the feast or the day of Hapshetsut from Egypt, uh, the feast of the good death or Boa Mort from Candomblé and Vaudun, uh, the Bon Festival from Japan, and the feast and uh, birth of Mary and the descent of the Holy Sophia from Catholicism. So, okay. Let's take a look at this because, there again, we're talking about a big old season and there's a bunch of work that we're doing. We know we're partying. We know we're feasting. We know we're competing. We're having a great time. Excellent. But what's going on? OK, so first and foremost, throughout August, we have a boatload of harvest festivals happening all across North America. Indigenous tribes from the southeast, like the Cherokee, the Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, and Timucua, and others celebrate their first 
corn harvests and the ripening of the second harvest, uh, starting at the end of the lunar month of July or when the first harvest is ready to eat. Celebrations continue throughout the lunar month of August and into the lunar month of September. Fires are put out and relit. Worn out items are destroyed and some people fast or purify themselves. Debts are forgiven and valuable or powerful items are cleansed, repaired, and displayed. Um, but other stuff that we are seeing at this time of year um, are these allyship uh, holidays that are happening. So we know we've got a lot of harvest festivals. Cool. Okay. Allyship. And our allyship holidays seem to happen in one of two ways. One is the ever popular knocking boots type of allyship. And we're seeing that with like the day of Loki and Sigyn. Um, side note, I know that there are people throughout time and around the planet who are like, that's not how you pronounce that. And I'm so sorry. Please come to me in my dreams and tell me how to say this stuff correctly. Thank you. Uh, we have the, the day of those two from the Odinist and Norse tradition. We have the wedding of Isis and Osiris. Um, and so we see that this is a time of year that, again, sacrificial mating, right? Getting together of the sacred knocking of boots, um, taking that last good urge, that, that best of from the god before they wane. Um, but we also see allyship in uh, terms of war and alliances august uh throughout recorded history or at least the last um 12 ish thousand years um was or is the most war-torn month of the year august has seen the most wars and the most warring around the planet for approximately the last 10 to 12 thousand years of recorded history my guess on that is um, simply that uh, we have a lot of light, a lot of heat, people can live outside, and there's a boatload of food. So if you feel like getting an army together and going and messing up somebody's day, um, you have lots of supplies and time to do that. You don't have to worry about housing for anybody. Um, but then there's also the, the issue of serotonin, right? In the middle of February, I don't care about anything. <laughs> serotonin is like... I have not gotten the laundry done. You want me to go to war? I don't know if I can muster that kind of like passion for anything right now. Versus August, which is like, I am filled with rage. Point me at something. You know? <laughs> like, let, let me go fuck, fight, and kill. You know, like, let, let's do this. And, um, pardon, pardon my language for anyways. But um, there, there's this real intensity there. So back and forth between the allyship uh, and, and, you know, looking deeply back into time, we see so many gods, and especially so many goddesses who were provider goddesses, who were also goddesses of love and war at the same time. Okay. So, we have these allyship holidays happening. Um, we have our festival, or our uh, fertility harvest um, holidays happening. But then we also have a couple of other things. Um... As much as there was a emphasis on oceanic goddesses during Letha season and Cancer season, there is still an emphasis around the world on oceanic goddesses and water goddesses, especially in the Yoruba traditions. Uh, due to the diaspora of the Yoruba land peoples, the feast dates for various deities are scattered uh, across the calendar, but the celebrations of Yemaya, the great ocean mother creatrix goddess, and her sister Oshun, goddess of rivers, often fall during Virgo season, particularly near the very beginning of September. So there is um, um, an emphasis or a, a, a drawing into that symbolism. So, so let me lay this out for you. At the beginning of Lunasad season, uh, the very end of July, all through the month of August, it's hot fire power. All of our deity, all of our um, gods that we're working with are uh, thunder and storm deities, which relate to sky gods, solar gods, warriors, skill set gods. There's a lot of weaponry, there's a lot of iron involved, all of that kind of stuff. And then as August wanes and we move into September, a different vibe begins to take place. And part of that is 
uh, moving into the worship of the oceanic goddesses. But part of that is moving into a worship or a recognition of some very particular death deities. Okay. So held on the first Sunday in August is Domnach Crom Dub, which is an Irish holiday dedicated to the deity Crom Dub. This Scottish Gaelic festival is dedicated to Crom Dub and his, uh, or excuse me, Crom Cruach in his Crom Dub form. Crom Dub means dark crooked one. You may have heard the, the children's fairy tale, there was a crooked man who walked a crooked mile. This is Crom Dub, that's that character. Um, and it refers to the hobbled god king after his sacrifice or defeat defeat so even though the god king the holly king has gone through some type of a sacrifice he does reign all the way through to winter solstice but there is something about the the holidays that we experience at this time of year that acknowledge these death deities that really are acknowledging the shift from the bright hot fast carefree reckless version of the holly king into a weakened a crippled version of the holly king and i don't think that he's only weakened or crippled but that is a part of his display or its display the display of that archetype is to say i went real hot i went real fast and now i'm a little worn out <laughs> like I, I i gave it all in my august and we have we have how many more months to go until winter so okay <laughs> I'm going to be limping the rest of the way. This is like only one of my eyes is good. Um, consider, again, our protester symbolism. Um, consider, we talk about in the Letha class at Summer Solstice, the connection to um, Christian symbolism between Winter Solstice and Summer Solstice. Winter solstice, of course, being the holiday closest to Christ Mass or Christmas or the Mass of Christ, um, and Christ's twin and brother, Saint John, his holy day is uh, on uh, summer solstice or June 24th, just after summer solstice. Well, the beheading of Saint John takes place now in Lunasad season. Um, and, and also as we move through Lunasad season into Virgo season, we begin to see the difference between the energy of the bright, hot, fiery, I can't be stopped, I can't be slowed down version of the Holly King and the oh wow, I took a hit, I'm limping now, things are a little bit different version of the Holly King. And I'm gonna push into that symbolism a little bit more when we get into tarot. Okay, but know that Crom Dub has a holiday at this time of year. The beheading of St. John takes place at this time of year. Other death gods that are being sacrificed or uh, having a, a, a significant death holiday at this time of year, uh, Shango, and of course Kronos, which is the orig or, orig original version of Saturn. Known, of course, for his giant sickle um, and the idea of grain gods as death gods, as life gods, as time gods, uh, we're going to get into that also. <laughs> You're like, when? We've already been talking for an hour and ten minutes. We'll get there, I swear to God. Okay. Um, and then another energy that's coming in that leaves behind the hot, brash, fiery, I can't be stopped warrior spirit of the beginning of Lunasad and ebbs into the more tamed, retreated Virgo version of Lunasad energy is that we see a ton of women's festivals happen at this time of year. Feast uh, and um, feasts of wisdom, um, some fertility stuff, a lot of healing happening at this time of year. There's a celebration for Matt and Sophia Saraswati and Metis uh, from the Gnostic tradition. Um, Mara Wu, uh, the women's healing and fertility ceremony from the Hopi tradition, um, and the uh, Chaturdashi, the women's purification 
uh, festival from Hindu tradition are just a few. Um, these are all bringing in a more um, mature version of the goddess. The last time that we worked really closely with the goddess is in springtime energy. And she's fecund and she's fertile and she's cute and curious and oh my god. <laughs> and then we have this moment of like, oh, I'm growing up. I'm, I'm maturing. I'm becoming this great oceanic goddess. Oh, my belly is getting big. I am a mother. I'm stepping into mother form uh, at, um, at Letha. But there's also this great solar energy that's coming out as well. And... Um, and then we step into this very hot, fiery warrior energy of Leo, uh, leadership, general type energy. Um, and then we retreat from it a little bit into Virgo season. And there is a maturity thing being emphasized with that and a bit of a retreat, a bit of a, a reclusion happening there, a pulling back from the action happening there. Um, and a celebration of... Uh, in particular, as I was saying, St. Sophia um, and birth of the, Mary, the Feast of the Birth of Mary and the Descent of the Holy Sophia, both happening at the same time of year, really the embodiment of wisdom, the embodiment of knowing. Um, and how do you know stuff? Because you actually experienced it, because you actually did it. And so this is a part of where that energy that's hot and fiery and brash that's like just get out there and make something happen well now we know what happened now we know what it's like to be a person that does that thing that makes that thing happen to push it forward and then we have that wisdom we have that experience we're still young we're still brash we're still in the high hot part of the year but even here we're learning we're growing <laughs> we're experiencing things um and as a side note to all of that Another interesting holiday-ish that happens at this time of year is that the women's uh, right to vote was granted during Lunasad season, and which I think is very interesting given that we have all of these femme-oriented uh, wisdom holidays happening at this time of year. Um, however, uh, that was a problematic moment even in and of itself, right? It feels, oh, yay, women got the right to vote. Well, white affluent women who were straight, able-bodied, if their husbands said it was okay, and if they felt like it, they got the right to vote. Women of color? No. Gay women? No. Trans women? No. Indigenous women? Absolutely not. So, in a sense, it was a marker of how far yet we have to go. I think that there's something really potent and powerful about um, getting together with people during this t during Lunasad season and talking about the elected officials that we are working with or that we could be working with. Seattle is about to uh, step up to a vote here in another couple of days and a very honorable Lunasad uh, tradition um, or a way of, of honoring or worshiping uh, Lunasad energies would absolutely be to vote. Hold a virtual vote party and get together with your community and talk about who you want to elect as the figureheads. Who do you want to elect as the face of your movements, right? A head, a face, the eye. Who do you want to be the figurehead of your movements, of your city, of the things that you care about? Um, now is a great time to use something like voting and it's more inclusive form now as a way of holding these leaders accountable, but also working with that leadership energy. Um, okay. Briefly, moving on, let's talk about the astronomy. And then we will move into the astrology. Oh, I'm missing stuff in chat. Hecate's night apparently supposed to be on August 13th too, where folks would make offerings to her to avert storms. That doesn't surprise me. Of course, there's multiple versions of Hecate. Um, so I expect that a version was um, being sacrificed to or offerings made to August 13th. Um, when we, si tangent, when we look at uh, specific dates like the 14th, the 21st, that type of stuff being connected to a Roman or a Greek deity 
what that actually means is the day of the moon, the day of the lunar cycle. So if a deity's day was the third day of August, it wasn't necessarily August 3rd, it was the third day of the moon in the month of August. So, and where did the moon start? Where does the, you know, where's the new moon? Where's the full moon? Where's the dark moon? All of that stuff. That's going to change from year to year, right? So not necessarily a perfect system, not exactly perfectly lined up, but that's a part of why months have 30 days is because it's more or less the lunar cycle, right? A month, month, moon, month, month, okay. Um, so her date, August 13th, would have been whatever the lunar cycle is in August, the 13th day of the lunar cycle in August is dedicated to Hecate. You can also just do the 13th of August because that shit's hard to figure out. So there's that. I don't think she minds. If she does mind, she'll probably let you know. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> but um, uh, the 13th day of the lunar cycle is the full moon. It's usually the, the, the first night of the full moon. Um, and so that's another way of knowing that if you're seeing in something Greco-Roman saying, oh, the, the 13th or the 14th or the 15th night of the month was dedicated to X, Y, Z, they're saying the full moon within that time period would have been dedicated to that deity. Um, yes, yes, yes. Nemoralia, absolutely, 100%. And involves an underworld journey. Interesting because of the Sophia Mary connection. Exactly, exactly. What we see so many times, and I've talked about this so many times in my classes, is how um, these same symbol sets just kind of get mixed up in the tumbler and then used again, and then mixed up in the tumbler and used again. Um, because the ancients were like, well, they really seem to be into this for some reason. So I don't know, put it on the table and we'll figure it out. <laughs> What's really, really fun and wild to me is we look back at the Greeks and Romans, and we think, wow, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, holy moly, Egyptians, same time period and even further back, holy moly, that's so far back. And we at times are attempting to emulate the things that they were doing in their holidays. They were emulating people from 7,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago. We are closer to the Greeks and their traditions than the Greeks were to the people that they were trying to emulate. It's so, so wild. But some of those traditions that we bring through um, from the Greco-Roman times literally are echoes. They are attempts at reinterpreting things that were happening 10,000 years ago at places like Gobekli Tepe and Gatul Hayuk. Um, you know, but it's, again, that... You throw it in the tumbler and the symbols get all mixed up and now I'm wearing the lion's head, but I've got the, you know, like, it's, it, it's crazy. It's so good. Um, okay. Astronomy and natural phenomenon for this time of year. Um, a, okay, there we go. August full moon names, September full moon names. I'm not going to go through all of them because we're already at 620. We got a lot to go, but uh, sturgeon moon, green corn moon, wheat cut moon, berry moon, all of that stuff. A lot, there's, a, there's really great resources, or just buy my book. Um, there's really great resources online for finding really cool collections of names for the full moons throughout time. A lot of the full moon names that we use here in North America come directly from the Algonquin Native American tradition. Um, they loved naming their moons, and a lot of our moon names we get directly from them. But a lot of these moon names come from all over the planet. I've really uh, tried to find stuff from Asia and from uh, Western Europe and Eastern Europe and Africa and, and all over the planet. Like, how, how have people referred to these names? Um, the full moons in August are always going to be uh, in or near the stars of the constellation Aquarius and Pisces. And interestingly enough, one of the most popular uh, August names is the Sturgeon Moon. You will also sometimes hear it in um, September, but usually not. Ooh, how does Neowise figure into what's happening this year? Well, you know, I have had some thoughts about that. <laughs> that might be another class. But in general, um, 
Much like a solar eclipse, a comet has often been considered a portend of negative events or harsh or hard events uh, in traditional astrology. Um, I think that different groups of astrologers probably have different opinions about that. Um, it has been in or near the constellation of Gemini, I believe, um, but it's moving pretty quickly-ish across the sky. It's moving a lot faster than any of our fixed stars or any of the planets are moving. Um, so well, we can kind of say that it's been in or near some constellations, but it's just sort of been zipping across the sky. Um, I think it might be a time will tell, and I think it might be really important to look at what were the, what was the date that we first saw Neowise? Um, what is the date that it got closest to the planet? And what is the date uh, that is like the last time we can see it from our planet. I think those astrologically might be really cool to uh, like jumping off points to explore what is Neowise bringing us or doing. But in general, um, I've kind of been a little sketchy about it. I've kind of been like, okay, you're cool. We'll see you in 6,800 years, I guess. But, you know, hmm. Because, you know, the solar eclipse uh, has... <laughs> It, it, it really kind of rang a bell of doom over our country. <laughs> um, yeah, that, it, it, it's good times. Okay, um, July 4th, exactly. Um, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, just locally, July 4th um, was that full moon, and that was the night that the protesters were hit on the freeway on I-5 here in Seattle. Um, and, uh, and I-5 is a major arterial that runs, um, from the very top to the very bottom of our country across the entire West Coast. Um, so, uh, you know, a reverberation that was felt energetically throughout all of the cities that touch I-5 that have been protesting. Um, Yeah. I don't know. Well, well, we should explore it. That's a great question, and we should explore it. Um, okay. September full moon names, uh, harvest moon, full corn moon, barley moon, scarlet plum moon, when the deer paws the earth moon. How cute is that? I love that. It's so cool. Okay. Uh, and the full moons in September are always near the stars of Pisces or Aries. Um, and I think that that that's also going to come into our symbolism here in just a second. Okay. Constellations and fixed stars. We have Leo the lion and Virgo the virgin. Um, at one point in history, uh, Leo was the largest constellation across the sky. No more. So Leos can go ahead and sit down, calm down. But the Moors charted leo running from taurus to scorpio they were like just this whole literal half of the sky that's leo and so when you're looking up fixed stars in other constellations they have like the the curly hair of the mane or the claw like the tip of the claw from the left part so it's like no stop <laughs> like rein it in <laughs> leo is right here stop it okay <laughs> um but we do still currently see um Stars like the blade, the loincloth, the tail, and Regulus, the little king, all being major uh, movers and shakers when the, within the constellation of uh, Leo. Um, and then our Virgo symbolism. Um, Virgo is still one of the largest, if not the largest, constellation in the sky. It vies with Scorpio for being the largest constellation in the sky. And the constellation of Virgo literally depicts a person lying back with their legs spread. Uh, hello, that's me all summer, forever, absolutely. Um, we have classic fixed stars here like Spica, which is the ear of grain, the Vindemiatrix, which is the grape gatherer, and Sirma, which means the trail or the good goer. And um, the constellation of Virgo, I'm going to talk about more when we get into Maybon season. Um, even though we technically are in Libra season at that point, I'm, I'm gonna talk about Virgo now and I'm gonna talk about Virgo more then. 
Um, but first and foremost, what are we seeing? We're seeing a depiction of the body of the goddess as Mother Earth. She's literally holding grapes in one hand and grains in the other. She's showing you, I provide, I produce. Um, what I absolutely love is the, the symbolism that um, Christianity borrowed um, because here we have a character who can clearly provide crackers and wine. Um, and we will be eating of her body. We will be eating of her flesh and drinking of her blood, which is the wine. Um, I'm sure it's just a coincidence. But um, sometimes that, that bunch of grapes is actually a palm frond, which connects to some really cool Jewish holidays that are happening at this time of year as well. Um, but in general, we have this person reclining back holding these offerings in their hands. And um, one of the interesting things about the way that she's depicted is, or the way the, const the archetype is depicted in the constellation, is that their head just comes up into a line of stars. There isn't like a real clear, that would be where the face is. And if we look back through um, uh, art history, and we look at some of the earliest carvings of uh, beings from Central Africa, which is some of the oldest artwork that we've got on the planet, time and time and time again, we see these goddess or female sculptures carved where everything is carved and then the head just comes up into a post. There's no face. It's just up into a post or, or a long line. Um, very similar to this. I might be projecting that onto this. I don't know that they're the same, but they look really similar to me and I thought that was really interesting. Um, but one of the interesting developments around those pieces of art is that for years, white Christian heterosexual <laughs> men, sorry guys, it's your team, uh, have looked at these sculptures and thought, well, why did this man carve this woman like that? Huh, I wonder, must not have given a shit about her head. Maybe she talked too much. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, now modern archaeo art history folk who are doing that research of art in archaeology, artistic movements within anthropological movements and archaeological movements, are beginning to come to the realization that these sculptures were carved probably by the women that they depict, that these sculptures were probably themselves, that these are the first selfies. <laughs> so very Leo, <laughs> very Lunasad season. It's me, bitch. But also literally it's me. And so when we're moving into that goddess energy, that archetypal symbolism of Virgo, we are coming into an entity that's like, I am building me. I am the creator and I am creating and you will eat of my creation. You will take of my creation. I am this thing. I built this thing and I hand it to you and you're going to do stuff with it now too. Just that super casual, but um, it kind of makes sense why this this uh, constellation would be so huge across the sky still even to this day. Oh, I guess I should mention, uh, Sirma, the trail, the good goer, literally the trail means the trail of their skirt. This star is meant to indicate the trail of their skirt, but um, it also represents literally a person a deity, a male uh, concubine or consort that is waiting at her heel for whatever she might need down there. Like, however I might be able to help you, ma'am. <laughs> I'm here, I'm down here already. Whatever you need, girl, just let me know. It's that, and we love that. Um, <laughs> other events that are happening at this time of year, we have the Delta Aquarid meteor showers as well as the Perseid meteor showers. And anytime we get a big chunk of meteor showers, we see here on Earth lots of lamp lighting festivals. And lamp lighting festivals certainly are starting here in Lunasad season, and they really ramp up in Maybon and Samhain season, um, right in conjunction with these meteor showers. Other stuff that's happening, cereal crops, in case I hadn't mentioned that already, cereal crops are coming uh, to harvest all over the Northern Hemisphere. Hindu Chattermas begins, which is a holy season marking four months of rain. We already are seeing incredible floods happening throughout India and China right now. So that kicked off actually closer to the end of June, uh, deep into July. Um, but again, this um, Chaturnamas uh, is excuse me, Chatterdashi is a woman's washing and fertility 
and healing festival from India. And here we have this very watery season. That's a four month season of rain and storm and torrential downpour. Rivers obviously swelling over their banks, just as they would have in uh, Egypt and the Nile. Um, but also that emphasis of our storm deities that we're working with, right? All these symbols in a big tumbler, swirl them around. What do we got this time? Okay. Um, other things that are happening at this time of year, the heliacal rising of Sirius and the heliacal rising of Procyon. Um, for Seattle, uh, the heliacal rising of Sirius is something that has marked holidays and festivals around the planet for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, it marked the end and the beginning of the Egyptian year. The Egyptian year actually started at this time of year. Um, they would refer to it as the Sothic cycle or the Sothic year, S-O-T-H-I-C. So if you're looking stuff up about this and you start seeing that word Sothis or Sothic a lot, this same thing. Um, but also if you decide to look up stuff on Sirius, oh my goddess, you had better get your premium uh, exclusive from my Patreon channel tinfoil fucking hat because wow. There's a lot of wild ass information on the internet connected to Sirius. No, it isn't. Um, a lot of people out there thinking a lot of things, a lot of opinions, less stuff, less, it, just take it all with a grain of salt or like an entire salt lick when you go out and you're trying to investigate on this. I have found that the very dry, boring, straightforward, uh, astronomy videos about Sirius or architecture, excuse me, um, archaeology and anthropology videos, but very dry, very boring, tend to hew very closely to reality and everybody else, it's like Pizzagate and emails and it's, it's QAnon and it's a bad scene. Lizard people, I don't know. It's a rabbit hole. You don't want to go down. So you've been warned, be careful. All right, moving on to the astrology. Okay. Leo moon work. I'm just gonna read this to you guys, then we're gonna talk about it a little bit. Any questions? Good, okay, <laughs> 20 second delay. JK. Astrology. The sun is traveling through Leo. Coming into this half of summer, it's time for us to put our shoulders back, fill our chests with fire and let out a good roar. It's time to make our mark on this world and to put our creations on pedestals. New moon in Leo, um, which actually this cycle through uh, Lunasad season is starting out with the uh, full moon in Aquarius and then we go to the new moon in Leo. Um, but as we're working through this cycle, full moon in Aquarius, um, is called the friendship moon. We head backstage for the after party. We celebrate friendships. We make allies. We strengthen bonds. We sign autographs and we consider the influence and importance of our friendships and connections to the shared mind. Now we've already talked about how many friendship and ally and boot knocking union style, um, holidays that we're seeing at this time of year and astrologically we have a re-emphasizing of that same energy with a full moon in Aquarius um, and again if we're going to think about that in light of our um, political state of affairs this is absolutely a full moon to emphasize celebrate work on investigate work around connecting to your community and finding out what they need. Not the people that you know, the people that you don't know. Um, your community at large, the global community, the, the, the bigger picture of the community, not just your besties, um, the community at large. That's Aquarius season is, um, an Aquarius energy is working with the community at large. And then uh, we will move into the new moon in Leo, 26 degrees Leo. <clears throat> and this is the sun child's moon. We demonstrate our radiance through creating, performing, or otherwise commanding the spotlight or taking a leadership role in joy for our community. So already in this 
uh, work here, we are seeing a, a real heavy emphasis of I'm stepping into my power. I'm stepping into my leadership role and I need to go out to the people and find out what do they need? Where do they need help? Where do they need support? Where do they need somebody that has my skill set? Where do they need somebody that has my tools, my connections, my bravado? Um, where do they need somebody to be brave and bold in the way that I do that? What, what is that? Where is that? And then on the new moon, we are making like a recommitment to the idea of I am doing this. I am taking up this mantle. I'm taking up this leadership role and I am stepping out into the world and I'm doing the thing that only I can do in the way that only I can do it. And then we will move into uh, Virgo season. And so our work in Virgo is about discernment. During Leo season, it's about pride, it's about performance, it's about spectacle, it's about taking up leadership roles and being willing to put our neck out on the line, literally perhaps, um, and saying, this is where I'm big and bold and powerful and let's, let's go, let's do this. Then when we move into the second half of Lunasad season and we move into Virgo, we are being asked to exercise our discernment and exercise a more critical eye and a more critical approach to what it is that we're doing and putting out into the world. Our attention begins to turn to the little details in life, taking care of our bodies, our homes, and looking to tie up loose ends. Uh, the full moon in Pisces at 10 degrees of Pisces, the healer's moon, uh, we are a little more sensitive to other people's hurts and we find a capacity in ourselves to be a healer to others as well as giving some love to healers in our communities. And then on the new moon in Virgo, which will be um, right toward the end of Lunasad season, I believe the new moon in Virgo is the 17th. Hey, I remembered something. All right. Yes. Um, we need time to be alone. This is the maiden's moon. Uh, to give ourselves a moment to stop and to get back to our own internal rhythm and peace and witness the beauty or at least the cycles around us. Okay. Um, yes, I'm going to read this for you guys. I think of Lunasad like the high point of a roller coaster where we hover weightless before hurtling back down to the earth. During the first half of Lunasad, the energy wants us to strut. We are the new king. We are the young queen. We are the golden rock star, the glittering pop star, dazzling under the flashing lights, taking up the stage and the mic and the camera. We are high on the heat of summer and the intoxication of people. Short nights, so less sleep, uh, warm skin, the smell of blooming flowers, bonfires and fireworks, or perhaps tear gas, depending on where you are in the country. The summer looks like it could go on forever. It feels like it could go on forever. Spontaneous adventures feel possible. Living is easy. Looking out across the land, the first harvest is coming in. Golden grains, boats full of fish. You can sleep outside. Lunasad wants us to go for it, blow it, and uh, just completely blow it out. Our budding fruits are ripening, and we are beginning to see the initial results from the year so far. So to emphasize that a bit, as we're doing our Leo moon work, we are taking time to get in touch with what is happening with the people around us, what is happening with the community around us. And then that new moon in Leo, we are saying, okay, I am stepping into a new cycle here. Um, so that's going to be the, the, you know, here's the first two weeks of Lunasad season. And then the next two weeks of Lunasad season is, okay, I'm stepping into a real cycle here and I am stepping into my power. I'm stepping into my leadership role. I checked with my community to see what they needed. And now I'm going to go do that. I'm going to embody it as best I can. And in this energy, so it's, it's really important actually that we are proud. It is a, it is, it's a global tradition during this time of year for you to wear your best clothes, to take out your, your best jewelry, show it off, 
polish that stuff up and put it out in the sun to charge, but also show it off. Be that person, be that king, be that queen. Um, and, and really lean into embodying that energy and embodying that power. Um, but then we move into the next portion and that is our Virgo moon work. And so as we move into the final weeks of summer during Virgo season, we can feel a little overblown, a little spent, a little hung over from the excesses of summer. A hermitage is just what the soul needs. Getting back to the personal, the daily routine, the simple self-care elements, the personal rituals of life. Also, it's hard to believe that this magical time will end, but the elder in us knows. The wheel turns and summer will end. Begin tending to the body, recalling the self-work like movement and diet that is so needed in fall and winter. Work with and check with and thank your community healers and people who hold space for us to have these hermetic moments, right? Because just because we're retreating doesn't mean the world is stopping. So we wanna say thank you to those people that are healing us and helping us and also keeping the wheel turning while we're taking a minute out for ourselves and getting focused and, and re-concentrated, pulling our energy back in. Okay. First off, the, um, the uh, names of the different moons, like Healer's Moon, Maynard's Moon, these come from Raven Caldera's book, uh, Lunar, excuse me, Moon Phase Astrology. It's a really great book. I highly recommend it. It's a really cool thing to work with both in interpreting things in your own uh, natal chart as well as syncing up with lunar cycles as we move through the year. It's got really great information in it, and I love it. Um, but bringing this this symbolism through as I keep talking about the protests and the politics of what's happening in our country right now, Leo season is really absolutely asking us to step up and get proud and get mad, be loud, be brash, be bold. Um, maybe push yourself a little bit harder than what you normally would push yourself. Um, and really be confident in the idea that there is something that you are bringing to this individual lifetime that's important. You're the only person that has it, and you're the only person that's gonna do it in the way that you do it. Everybody has something important to bring. That's also part of the Aquarius energy that we're working with um, during the, the Leo moon portion of Lunasad. Um, Aquarius says, Leo says, I'm special. Give me my audience. Aquarius says, you're special because we are all special and we are all simultaneously. Oh God, I don't even want to talk about Mars and Aries, but yes. <laughs> um, we are all special. I am special because we are all special and we are all simultaneously required and encouraged to be our most individualistic selves because that's how we get the full variety of life. That's how we see the full capacity and the full potential of our species is if every single one of us does us and stops worrying about doing everything else. Um, but then part of that is what makes us stand out, right? And so part of that uh, energy is what can potentially put a target on us and say like, oh, this person is anxious and willing to step up and step out and, and take the attention and be the center of the show. Okay, well, we're going to, we're going to come for you. And so in Virgo season, we might be healing from whatever it is that we've experienced, or we might be, um, just taking one or two steps back enough to the figureheads are still out in the front, but I'm here in my wisdom. I'm here in my slowing down. I'm pulling my energy in a little bit and I'm watching and I'm paying attention and I'm using my discernment when I look out at what is happening in the world. I'm using my discernment in terms of uh, what I'm going to get involved in and what I'm going to continue to support and dedicate my energy to because we are about to begin to harvest the effects of all of these things that we are doing. So it's vitally important <laughs> that we get really, really square with what it is that we are doing out in the world and why. Okay, um, 
for more work on this type of stuff for you as an individual, um, I highly recommend uh, pulling up your own natal chart and taking a look at what houses Leo and Aquarius are in, as well as Virgo and Pisces. Those four houses in your life, those four sections of your life, are probably going to have some extra attention, extra energy, extra intensity, require extra attention or extra work from you during this season. If you have any planets there, um, the sun is either rolling over it or opposing it. Um, so, you know, talk with an astrologer, set up an, a, a reading with me. We'll talk about it. Um, but those are places that there's, there's going to be emphasis for you. And that's going to be true every season, uh, there, or excuse me, every year. As we roll through Lunasad season, if you've got stuff in those four places, you know, and everybody has those four houses somewhere in their chart. So these houses are always going to be buzzy and vibrating for you during summertime. Okay. Um, the meditations for the astrological work are for our full moon in Aquarius. What is allyship? And how can you be a better ally? And how can you better support your community? Um, allyship is tough because we don't get to define it. Other people will tell us if we are being a good ally and what they need from us. So again, the requirement here is I got to go talk to people and I got to go talk to people that I'm normally not talking to. I need to go check in with groups that I might want to support, but I have no idea what they need from me. I need to go find out. I might be told I'm wrong in a few places. That's me learning to be a better ally, right? If I'm here to help and I'm not helping, then I'm not being an ally. So very vital that we check in with our community, we discover what is allyship for those people, and then how can we best utilize what we do naturally, what we are naturally, to push toward this goal, to push toward being able to help and support our community individually and at large. And then new moon in Leo, um, list three talents you want to learn or improve. Make a quick plan to do so and then demonstrate, show it off. And again, that's that emphasis of Leo needing to be the star of the show, but we wanna do it in a way that's best for us and best for the community at large. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being like, bitch, I just need to be on stage and get some attention, damn it. No problem. Uh, uh, natal or transiting, natal, natal chart. Um, you want to look at the those four houses in your natal chart. Uh, but yes, this new moon is asking us to um, step into that idea of, I do have something to show off. I do have something to perform. I do bring something to the party that nobody else is bringing. And it's my job to bring it. I have to, I have to, have to. And then we move into Virgo season. Uh, full moon in Pisces. Consider the toll the body takes living in this world. Write a letter to a healer of any kind and send it or burn it. Um, if it is a healer that is no longer alive, I definitely recommend burning it and you can release that energy into the universe and they will get that letter. Um, but if it is a healer that is actually living, please, 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 please put a stamp on it and mail it. Let's support the United States Postal Service, okay kids? Let's do this. So write a letter to a healer, handwritten, even better, right? Show off your beautiful cursive. You're probably thinking to yourself, my handwriting is terrible. I don't wanna hear it. Um, tuck it into a beautiful envelope, give it a little spritz of some perfume and stick a stamp on it and send it off to that healer and thank them for the work that they do in community. Um, whether you're working with them currently now or not, um, uh, maybe it's just somebody that you know is a healer in c your community and, and deserves a high five from the universe. You can be that high five. Um, and then last but not least, uh, the new moon in Virgo. If it is at all possible, take some time to truly be alone. Consider the things that you have, that have grown under your care this year. And I'm sure here we are in the state of COVID, right? And you're like alone. Are you joking? What are you talking about? This woman is crazy. No, seriously. Um, I mean, alone, alone, like no internet, 
turn off your phone, be with yourself. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even do any heavy duty reading. Honestly, I would really take the time. And that might be, you know, an afternoon into the next morning. If it, if you can do a weekend, awesome. If you can do a week, freaking great. That's really, really cool. If you can only just hunker down in your own spot, do that. Have a spa night, order in some food, you know, just like really take a moment and enjoy and be with yourself and sit with yourself. Um, if you can get out of town and go camping or go rent a cabin somewhere, even better, even cooler. Do that. That is awesome. Um, but be alone. That is the most important thing that you can do during this last portion of Lunasod season. Those last couple of weeks of Lunasod season really, really need your, your, your capacity to be alone. Okay, and last but not least, let us get into the tarot. It's not the last. I don't know why. I always say that with this, and it's, it's a lie. Um, Lunasod tarot helpers. Let's do this one first, and then we'll come back and look at that bigger one. Because for the most part, what we're going to talk about is the Strength card and the Hermit card. The Strength card relates to Leo, and the Hermit card relates to Virgo. And in the Strength card, what we are in our Leo season, and we're working with this archetype, we are uh, moving from the gut. We are tapping into our raw and natural talent, and we are standing in the spotlight. And then when we move into Virgo season, the archetype that we are working with encourages us to move from the soul and we are working with acquired wisdom and we are retreating and we are spending some time alone so again i'm just going to read to you guys briefly here and then we'll jump back into it as we ride the high of summer we come into an energy current that could be described as an original vibe of our spirit as expressed in the strength card a wild, natural way of being. One long, mighty, authentic flex. Many religions believe the ease of summer reflects a golden age, a time of peace and abundance that humans have lost by not attending to the old ways. If only we could wrangle our lower urges, we could potentially have this golden kingdom again. It's that wrangling or getting a hold of our desires and fears from this individual lifetime that is the key. All of us have an invitation to the higher dimensions of existence, but before we have traversed the labyrinths of this reality, we may, not, we may just not be tuned in to those other realms. It is the challenge of existence that not only tunes us into our personal power, but actually creates the maze of misunderstanding we must wander before we can know why we have incarnated in this and all lives. Before we can remember that we've been walking in the higher realms the whole time. We just got lost in the here and now. However, in our day-to-day -day lives, we forget that we are actually a family. We are a team. We fight each other to simply play devil's advocate. We stay in little pawns to not feel small. We display power for the sake of power. We hold our ego righteously aloft, bristling with offense, come hell or high water. We sate our spirit's longing in the short-term pleasures this world distracts us with. We create friction for the sake of friction. As species, many of us have forgotten that we are meant to be window panes, to allow the light to shine through. We have forgotten to be the light and to be conductors of the light. We could be stewards for each other and the planet. As summer begins to wane, we have a chance to pull back and think about our connection and responsibility to our real personal power to the future and the present. What is your responsibility to build a better 
now. And if we all begin to consider that and work toward it, what kind of a world would we be producing? Given this way of thinking, what kind of reality are we harvesting currently? Is there a way to approach this kind of competitive, small world view with something more performative and expansive? Remember, all the world's a stage. So as we work with these two characters, and side note, okay, we have four minutes left, awesome, uh, approximately. I'll probably go over, welcome to my class. Um, <laughs> um, in the strength card, what we are seeing is a being in a white or a translucent robe, which indicates their originalness, their OG spirit, their naturalness. We could say that they are sky clad, right? They are um, naked, they are without ego, they are without artifice, and they're reaching down and grabbing this lion by the mouth. Uh, star, uh, strength cards will depict this image a bunch of different ways, uh, but there's always some sort of hands-on or very close physical interaction <clears throat> between the being and the lion that is almost always on this card. Uh, they're standing barefoot on the ground. They're here at the, uh, in a valley in the natural world. So they're showing themselves to be very natural, organic, real, original, uh, basic or fundamental. Authentic, we might say. They are authentically themselves. They have this infinity symbol over their head showing us just how close they are to source. And they're reaching down holding this lion by its mouth. First off, uh, in the esoteric traditions, Leo is connected to the power of speech. Again, our figurehead giving speeches, um, the, the head of a movement speaking on behalf of, right? All of that stuff. Um, but we also, if we look carefully at this drawing, we can see a wreath going around the person and underneath the, the chin or around the neck of the lion. The wreath is a wreath of roses, and we see roses throughout tarot. Roses represent our passion from this finite lifetime, our desires, our wants, our urges. And what we're seeing in this picture basically is a person who is capable of standing in their authentic power and using that to wrangle their lower urges, which is represented by the lion, to ultimately say what needs to be said to get the word out, to get the thing done. And then beyond them or next to them is our Virgo symbolism, which is the hermit. And in the hermit, they are standing in an exactly opposite place. The strength card is depicted at the bottom of a valley and the hermit is at the tippy top of some snowy mountains. They are physically about as far away from each other as they could be. And yet they're sort of working in conjunction with this. Um, my metaphor for the hermit is a person who goes on a personal quest and they have trials and travails that really beat them up and teach them a lot of things and they grow in their wisdom but they're ultimately out on this quest to go find the guru and they make it to the cave they make it to the top of the mountain the fire is out they're like cool i found where the guru lives let me get the fire going this is going to be great i'm so excited and they hear footsteps and they're like "Woo! the guru is coming and this person comes around the corner and goes aha the guru the, the point of the experience that we have in the hermit card is to teach us that all that crazy shit that we just did during Leo season and summer and spring for that matter was not just for us. It wasn't just for our own edification. It wasn't just for um, our own enlightenment or our own entertainment. It was ultimately to weather us. It was ultimately to build, help us build character, to help us refine uh, and discover our skills. Um, and and to figure out what is the wisdom that we have acquired. There's things that I naturally know, but there's things that I learn through living, learn through, exper through experience. And that is the stuff that the hermit represents for us. And that's a part of the retreat that we need in the hermit card and in Virgo season is we need to take a step back from the battle. We need to take a step back from the show and Think about it for a moment, process some things, compare notes, write some stuff down, chew on it for a little while and, and let a little time pass. And then 
we make our refinement we use our discernment we say oh this didn't work that worked i could make this better i don't need that at all and then we're going to head back out again and, and do the thing um, but that's a big part of the energy that we're really working with as we move from Leo into Virgo season is this idea that, you know, I have the capacity to embody this strength, these talents, this power, and I should, but also that's going to work me out a little bit and I may need to take a moment to retreat and to recuperate and to heal from that process and do the thing. It also, again, coming back to our protesters, really makes me think about these brash, bold lions that are stepping out into the world and taking tear gas canisters to the face. And they're out there every single night and they are willing to put their bodies on the line. It is a type of protesting that is powerful, but short-lived. Bodies can't take that kind of abuse over and over. Minds cannot take that type of abuse over and over. And a literal physical retreat and healing moment is required. But also in that moment, we get to recuperate and review and, and use our discernment on what worked, what didn't, what do we do next, where do we go next, what happens next, um, and, and view things with a critical eye. Because when you're in the moment of chaos, you can't stop to review. You can't stop to be critical and, and use your discernment in the moment, or it's very, very difficult to do so. Usually it's a, ah, and then let me get out of here and think about it for a minute, and then I'll have a new plan, and I'll come back with a whole new bag of supplies, and it'll be great. Um, so that's tarot. Um, and for folks that really want to work with tarot right for this season, um, I definitely recommend the Strength and the Hermit card, but you can also work with all four of these. Strength card, Hermit card, that's Leo and Virgo, and then the Sun card, which aligns to the Sun, and that is the celestial ruling body of the sign of Leo, and the Magician card, which aligns to Mercury, and that is the planetary ruling body of Virgo, or the Hermit. Um, there's so much to say about this and it's already 703 so I apologize we can't get into it take my tarot class and we will get into it <laughs> it probably feels like a bait and switch sorry <laughs> don't hate me um all right so let's do the meditations um if you got the book read this page we don't have time to get into it so sorry so there's a there's a, a a reason for you to go get the book. There's a lot here about bog bodies and different gods and kings that have been uh, sacrificed throughout time. Uh, the tradition of the loaf mass um, and all of that good stuff. So last but not least, our meditations. Um, I recommend using these uh, during ritual. Um, you can use them throughout the season. Um, you can use them as uh, prayers that you say out loud. You can use them as journaling prompts. Um, yeah, I would, I would use these as jumping off places and, and let your intuition guide you in your work. Um, so meditations for Lunasad. What have you sown this year? And what is already coming to fruition? This is first harvest. And so think about your year's cycle starting from February and moving to now. Um, February being in bulk season. Um, if, if that's too esoteric, start with spring and think about everything that you've been doing during this current energetic cycle. But I encourage you to go all the way back to February and think about what have you sown this year? What have you attempted this year? What have you tried to foster this year? And of those things, what are you already starting to see results from? What loose ends or toxic situations are draining you? And can you attend to that with positivity? Um, and I don't mean like just plaster a smile on your face and be like, okay, this is great, we're gonna figure it out. <laughs> I don't mean that. I mean, what things can you approach with an open heart from a loving standpoint? They may still need to be killed. They may still need to be sacrificed, but can you do it from a place of joy? Can you do it from a heart centric place that is roses and amber and all of that yummy good stuff? 
Um, but truly, what loose ends or toxic situations are draining you? Now is a really important time to address that situation and talk with yourself about that as well. And then finally, um, can you anticipate the harvest? Um, in, this, uh, in this practice, um, one of my forms of worship that I always recommend for people is simply go outside and witness the earth. And in this one in particular, I recommend that you literally go to the earth, lay on it, breathe it in, smell the dirt. What is it telling you? What is it saying to you? What are you getting from that experience? And I would very much recommend uh, doing that um, at the very beginning, like right on Lunasad if you can, go out and smell the dirt, hug a tree, be in nature, lay on the ground, and then do it right before fall equinox and see if you can sense the shift, see if you can sense the change. But in this practice, you, we could think of this as kind of a, a, a ritual in and of itself. Go out, lay on the ground, smell the earth, and as I'm asking you here, what does it say? What can you sense is coming in the harvest? And that could be personally for you, your community, our country, the world at large, what is coming in the harvest? Um, and journal that stuff, maybe talk into your phone, write stuff down, but really be present and be aware for odd messages, things that don't make sense, sounds, memories, um, things that you think you see in the corner of your eye, that type of stuff. That's often the way that these energies will communicate with us. They're not going to be like, well, Bob, it's going to be like this and that. Da, 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 da. So sometimes it is, and that's really cool. It's helpful. But, <laughs> but generally, no. Um, briefly, I'm going to skip through the rest of the slides um, for stuff that you might work with at this time of year. Uh, these are our animal helpers that are really assisting us at this time of year. All big cats, serpents, crocodiles, peacocks, and roosters. I can't think of animals that are more showy than a peacock or a rooster. Cats who have life completely dialed in. I'm going to lay in this beam of sun for five hours. I'm not really sure what you're doing. Um, but I'm just going to lay here and be fabulous. Pet me. Thank you. Um, Incense and oils that are fantastic to work with at this time of year. And uh, there's some crossover between incense and oils, plants, and foods. So obviously, eat whatever is safe to eat and drink, but don't otherwise. But any of this stuff could, could potentially be anywhere. So there's that. Amber, benzoin, frankincense, neroli, rose, aloes, wood, oak moss, and rosemary. The oak moss and rosemary uh, and benzoin in particular... Uh, are really great for Virgo vibes. Uh, the amber frankincense, neroli, and aloes wood are really great for Leo vibes. A uh, rose as well, really great for our Leo vibes. But any of this can be burned throughout the season. Uh, food and drink. Anything and everything that is in season right now is completely appropriate, but especially corn, grain, blackberries, ginger. Um, drinks like absinthe barley wine and barley water barley water is amazing um it is a really traditional drink that's been super popular it was very popular in the victorian era but it's been popular for hundreds of years very refreshing right very revitalizing when the heat gets so hot that it kind of saps you of your energy um chicory olives all any and all baked goods um beets of course and like i said anything you can put ginger in absolutely appropriate for this time of year um Mineral helpers, sunstone, pyrite, gold, ruby, onyx. Um, these are all great for Leo vibes. And then diopside, peridot, magnetite, geodes, and fossils. Very, very tied in with our Virgo vibes. Peridot is one of the ones that kind of crosses over because peridot is a August stone. So it's some Leo and some Virgo. Um, pretty cool stone to work with, honestly and plant helpers, mugwort, marigold. And again, honestly, anything that is naturally growing is a plant helper right now. So just because it's not on this list doesn't mean that it isn't trying to assist you currently. But also, poppy, meadowsweet, honeysuckle, hazel, sunflower, ivy, grain, slow, and chrysanthemum. And again, any of these that are safe to eat are obviously totally cool to use as um, 
plant helpers in that regard. Any of these that are not safe to eat, you can decorate your altar with them. You can dry them inside and use them for spell crafting throughout the year. All of that good stuff. Um, all right. And that brings us to the end. Thank you so much for hanging out with me for well over two hours. <laughs> Happy Lunasad season. Um, I encourage all of you heartily to be bold, to be brash, to be incredible, to be uh, proud, to witness your power, accept the responsibility that comes with owning your power, your skill set, what it is that you do in this lifetime that no one else does like you. Um, I, I heartily support you and encourage you to step into that place knowing that it's a little hot, knowing that it's a little dangerous, um, but knowing that it's part of the responsibility. When you're able to see, that means you know, means it's your place to step up and do something about it. Um, uh, good luck out there. Power to the rebellion. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, go kill a king. Happy Lunaside season. Blessed be, y'all. Bye. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Ooh.